بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أمسينا وأمسى الملك لله والحمد لله لا شريك له لا إله إلا هو وإليه النشور أمسينا على فطرة الإسلام وكلمة الإخلاص وعلى دين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى ملة أبينا إبراهيم حنيفا وما كان من المشركين اللهم أن أمسينا منك في نعمة وعافية وستر فأتم علينا نعمتك وعافيتك وسترك في الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما أمسى بنا من نعمة أو بأحد من خلقك فمنك وحدك لا شريك لك فلك الحمد ولك الشكر يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك رضينا بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم نبيا ورسولا أحبتي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وطبتم وطاب ممشاكم وتبوأتم من الجنة منزلا بإذن الله عز وجل I'm really really glad to be with you tonight It was a pleasure meeting with you twice today during Salat al-Jum'ah and this is the third meeting with this blessed community may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and make your masjid masjid and usis ala taqwa min awwal yawm As it was announced interest-bearing transactions in the U.S. and introduction to Islamic finance. Very practical and very dynamic and very touchy topic because uh, we all face it and we all have a lot of questions when it comes to uh, conduct Sharia compliant transactions. And we have actually a lot to uh, uh, say here in the introduction of the topic Number one is that uh, everybody knows, Muslims and non-Muslims as well, that Muslims do not deal with riba. Even, even our neighbors, our fellow Americans know that Muslims do not deal with, with interest. Uh, that is something agreed, you know, agreed upon. The challenge that we face here is not whether or not riba is haram. What are the riba transactions to be avoided? And what are the non-riba transactions to be conducted safely? That's number one. And number two, the whole economic and finance system is a very traditional, very uh, 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 capitalist, you know, economic and finance system, where riba is uh, is integrated and uh, an, uh, an integral part of the system, where it's really, really hard to believe that there are some lending activities with no riba involved in it. And the third thing is that how to keep that balance between living. In a, in a society that is a, a non-Muslim society, and the economic and the finance system is a non-Islamic one, while preserving our Muslim identity and not compromising our principles, of course, by staying away from, from riba. Of course, everybody knows that riba is haram every time and everywhere, whether you live in Mecca al mukarramah or live in the United States or any time, anywhere, riba actually is to be, is to be avoided. In order for us to uh, reach to this level where we can identify, identify the interest-bearing transactions and avoid them, and whatever is not riba to be safely conducted, we need to educate ourselves actually more in riba. Having said that, riba actually does have different categories. Maybe you have heard about riba al-fadl, and riba al-nasa, and riba al-nasi'ah. I do not want anyone to get confused tonight with all these big terms. Let's focus on the most prevailing, and the most prevailing, and the most severe level of riba. That whenever you hear an ayah in the Quran, وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيْعَ وَحَرَّمَ الْرِبَا اتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَذَرُوا مَا بَقِيَ مِنَ الْرِبَا لَا تَأْكُلُوا الْرِبَا أَضْعَافَ مُضَعَفَ. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is referring to this particular, this particular level or category of riba. Whenever we hear the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام warning us against any kind of involvement in riba, he is referring to this kind of riba. This riba actually is riba al nasiya This kind of riba is riba al jahiliya This kind of riba is riba al diyun It's a very, very straightforward to the point. You borrow a certain amount of money, and you have to pay more than what you have borrowed. As simple as that. This is something actually was very, very common and practiced by the society before the prophethood of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And even after his prophethood, all the way until riba became permanently, permanently, until the day of judgment prohibited. Okay. You read, for example, in Muatta al-Imam Malik, كان الرجل يقرض الرجل. 
فإذا جاء الأجل قال أمهلني وأزيدك كان الرجل يقرض الرجل فإذا جاء الأجل قال إما أن تقضي وإما أن تربي People used to lend to one another upon the maturity of the loan the borrower would approach the lender by saying أمهلني وأزيدك I do not have enough money to pay you give me more time I'm going to pay you more okay. or otherwise maybe the creditor would approach the borrower by saying إما أن تقضي وإما أن تربي listen the loan is due okay you either pay me and you are, you're good to go there is no consequence or if you want if you want more time I'm willing to give you more time but you need to pay me more فأنزل الله سبحانه وتعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وذروا ما بقي من الربا إن كنتم مؤمنين so this is actually the most severe uh, and the most prohibited level of or category of riba. Well, surprisingly, the vast majority of the transactions, the vast majority of the transactions that we always ask about belong to this particular level of riba. Always there is lending activities, sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, okay? But the riba that we need to avoid here, it's not riba al-fadl when you exchange like a homogeneous commodity, like orange for orange or wheat for wheat. I mean, this is something that does not exist nowadays, right? We deal in, in, in a very modern, a very sophisticated financial system where lending activities actually is the most prevailing kind, kind of riba. The very confusing part here, or the challenge that we face again, is that how to identify, how to identify whether or not a certain transaction does have riba nasiya, okay, or the interest-bearing loans or not. The very, very tricky point here is that a lot of charges are introduced to you to pay or to get involved in under several names, under several names. You hear nowadays about, uh, about overdraft charge, right? You hear nowadays about uh, uh, late fees, Sometimes, I mean, um, a, certain, a certain charge or a certain money you receive is called revenue. Sometimes a profit, sometimes dividend, right? Sometimes interest, sometimes usury. And we get confused, I mean, I mean where is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited? Before I proceed, we need to uh, learn by heart. By heart, in the language that you, you know, prefer to memorize it, but you need to you know, know it by heart, okay? العبرة في العقود العبرة في العقود للمقاصد والمعاني لا للألفاظ والمباني العبرة في العقود للمقاصد والمعاني لا للألفاظ والمباني What matters in transactions is the reality and the essence and not the formality or the wording So do not, do not be tricked with certain terms No, you need to dig in depth and understand the essence and the nature of the transaction And I can give you a lot of examples where there is a very clear like discrepancy or very clear contradiction between the essence of the transaction from one side versus the terms that are used. Now this contradiction actually comes from a very simple reason that, that the industry here, the finance industry actually, does use certain terms. And those terms actually have their own definition according to the industry. Well, when you make a very quick comparison between those terms as I said, late fees, overdraft charge, revenue, dividend, profit. When you, when you try to bring them to the, to, the, to the Islamic definition, they might be the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited, and they might not. Now, we know for a fact that when we say riba, we refer to the most severe kind of riba, which is the premium that must be paid by the borrower to the lender, along with the principal amount. Again, you go to Bank of America, you borrow $1,000, you know from day one that that $1,000 has to be paid back $1,200. This is, this is exactly the riba that we need to avoid, right? Along with the principal amount, either as a condition for the loan, either as a condition for the loan. If you are willing to pay me $200 on top of the $1,000, I'm willing to give you. Now, this is one scenario. And the other one, or for an extension of its maturity, you might take you might borrow $1,000, zero interest for a certain period of time, okay? And you have a grace period, you have introductory period. You have a 12 months like when you have a credit card nowadays, okay, some of them give you zero APR, is that correct? That's commonly known as introductory period 
or a grace period. If you commit to paying the minimum payment on a monthly basis, all the way until the end of the grace period, you do not have to pay, you know, the, 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 the what they call it, the, uh, the balance statement, okay? Okay, toward the end, you need to make sure that you paid off that loan in full. Otherwise, you have to pay, you have to pay interest, right? So, back to the point. This is the riba that we are referring to. It's the riba that we are referring to. The problem here is that, the challenge that we face is that certain terms have different definition in the industry than the definition in the Islamic law or in the Islamic finance system. I'll give you some, some, some examples. Why we believe that opening a saving account is not an option for practicing Muslims? You cannot have a saving account. And you ask a question, why? I have $5,000 and I want to make some, some profit, okay? And I deposit that 5000 at the Chase or Bank of America and they give me a, 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 a return on investment. They give me a profit, they give me a dividend. It's not riba, we call it dividend, we call it profit, we call it, I mean, anything else other than interest, okay? They give me a 3% annual. It's a win-win situation. The bank makes some money and I make some money, everybody's happy, I mean, why you, why you wanna make it haram? Well, let's take one step back. If, uh, if I give you $5,000, I give you $5,000, and I tell you, you need to pay it back to me, 5100 So you guarantee the principal, and you guarantee the return, okay? Like the, the, the premium. You take from me 5000 you pay it back 5100 This is a straightforward interest-bearing loan, because my principal is guaranteed, and my profit on top of this transaction is guaranteed. Whenever the principal is guaranteed, and the Prophet is guaranteed this is the interest-bearing loan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. So when I approach Bank of America and I open saving account with $5,000, believe it or not, this is an interest-bearing loan. I am lending my money to Bank of America. You might say, well, is it, is it, uh, is it true that, that uh, I mean, is it possible that the bank is borrowing money from you? I mean, the bank has millions of dollars and you have only 5,000. I mean, the bank does not need to borrow money from you. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't go this way, okay? The, the, the fiqh interpretation, okay, does not care about who has a lot of money and who has less money. What we care about is the interpretation of the transaction. I am advancing $5,000 to someone, and my principal by the FDIC is guaranteed, and the return on those 5,000 is guaranteed, whether the APR is 1% or 100%, or it doesn't make any difference. We are not discussing details, we are discussing the, the concept. Whenever the principal and its return both are guaranteed, that's an interest-bearing loan. That's an interest-bearing loan. And, and that's why opening a saving account, saving account is not an option. You may ask a question, what is the, what is the alternative? Well, if the main reason behind opening a saving account is to save your money against any identity theft. You have like a, a good amount of money and it's not safe to keep it home. I completely understand. You can open two different, two different checking accounts. One of them with a few hundreds of dollars for the day-to-day -day, um, uh, expenses and the big amount of money, the chunk you know, amount, you can put it in another checking account but do not release its information. As long as you do not use a debit card or, or you know, the checks, the, ident the possibility of identity theft goes down to goes down, down to zero. If the reason behind opening saving account is that you want to make some, some revenue, some, some profit, I understand. Why do not you open a Sharia compliant mutual, mutual fund account? Mutual fund. We have a lot of you know, um, um, socially and ethically responsible mutual fund companies in the US. Talk about Amana fund and Zad fund and, and, and Sharia portfolio, maybe 10 different, 15 different um, Islamic mutual fund uh, companies. So opening a, a mutual fund account would help you setting off the inflation, okay, and setting off the, uh, uh, the, the, the zakat that you have to pay, the 2.5% that you have or you are expected to pay on an annual basis. So this is an example, okay. When the bank actually gives you 1 or 2 or 3% APR, okay, uh, he is not introducing those APR as an interest. But from our, our own interpretation, our own understanding, is that whatever, whatever I'm receiving on top of the principal 
is counted as counted as interest, right? This is one example. Other example, every single utility bill that you receive does have a due date. And if you delay your payment after the due date, you have to pay what is called late fees. Here you go, late fees. Well, believe it or not, this late fees is a kind of riba. Let's take one step back, try to understand or unlock the secret of the transaction. I have a contract with, uh, with uh, T-Mobile, and I'm supposed to pay them uh, $250 for the family plan that I have for myself and my, and my kids. I'm not borrowing money from T-Mobile. I'm utilizing their service. Toward the end of the month, I owe them, I owe them $250. From a fiqh perspective, according to the Islamic finance principles, debts are equivalent to loans. So when I owe, in my example, when I owe T-Mobile $250, it is interpreted, it is, it is treated, dealt with, as if it is a loan, as if I'm already borrowed from them $250. Well, if that is the case, then I'm supposed to pay only and only $250. If I intentionally, willingly delay my payment until after the due date, I am committing a sin because whatever I pay on top of the $250 in our example will be counted as riba. Okay? This is my interpretation as practicing Muslim. This is not their interpretation. They look at it as just a late fees. I mean, you did not pay on time, so you're supposed to pay us more, okay? As a penalty, as late fees, they call it. This is another example. Third example. You have only and only $200 in your checking account. And you do not, like, withdraw cash money. You use a debit card. So you went somewhere, like a point of sale, and you made a transaction of $300. Usually, it goes through. Usually it goes through, right? And to your surprise, when you check your, your like online bank statement, you find out that there is a $100 extra that you have to pay to the bank, which is fine. And there is an overdraft charge. Oh, that's an overdraft charge of $35, $35, okay? Now, what kind of uh, payment, what kind of charge is the $35? Let's take one step back, as I always say. What is the interpretation of the transaction? When you made a transaction, when you made a, 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 a transaction of $300, did you borrow from the bank? Well, you bought something for $300, and the only thing that you have in your account at that time was how much? $200. $200. It means from a fiqh perspective that you spent, you spent your $200 and you borrowed from the bank $100. The agent actually did not give you a call, okay, I'm, I'm gonna lend you money, you, I, mean, I mean, this is how the system works, okay? Usually, usually the transaction goes through, okay? It means from a fiqh perspective that the bank actually is paying on your behalf. Up to this point, I mean, we do not have any issue, but the issue here is that you do not have to pay back only $100, you have to pay $100 plus something else. That something else is called, in the, in the industry, in the business, is called overdraft charge. Overdraft charge, according to our interpretation, it is none but, but riba. So what is the alternative here? Uh, check, your, uh, check your balance every day before you start doing any transaction. Make sure that you have you know, enough fund. If you have fund, go ahead and, and, and buy and purchase. If not, then, then do not do it. So whatever you pay on top of the uh, amount that you have borrowed from the bank, whatever introduced to you as an overdraft uh, charge, is actually none but, but, but riba. Those are examples of different charges okay, that you receive or you pay, you repay, introduced to you as something else, but in reality, in reality, they are none but riba, according to the proper definition of, of riba. Now let's take a, 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 a otherwise example. You want to buy a car, used car from your neighbor, non-Muslim neighbor. And he was uh, asking for $5,000 cash. And he said, I do not have 5,000 cash. So he said, okay, let's, let, let's make it 5,000, 5,000 price, plus uh, $1,000 interest for one, one year payment plan. If you do not have $5,000 cash, let's, let's make it one year payment plan 
but the, the total will be $6,000. $5,000 price and $1,000 interest. And he insisted in writing $5,000 price and $1,000 interest. Now, do you think that if you buy that car from its owner directly, without having any bank or any third party to lend you money, okay, do you think that those extra $1,000 that you have to pay introduced to you as interest, that they are interest? They are not, believe it or not. They are not. Okay. The, the, the cash price is 5000 And before closing, be, before like coming up with a deal, the, 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 the door for negotiation actually is open. I mean, he can offer you $5,000 cash, $6,000 for one year, $7,000 for two years, $8,000 for three years. He can give you unlimited options. Okay? Up to this point, from a Sharia perspective, I mean, I mean we good. There is no, um, um, there is nothing like haram here involved. Once, once we close, once we choose one of those options, once we close, we close. That's it. We have to limit ourselves. We have to abide with the with the agreement. Is it five thousand dollars cash? If the answer is yes, then you pay it and then you take your car. If it is six thousand dollars for one year, then it has to be six thousand dollars for one year. 6,000 divided by 12, that's $500, $500, okay? The monthly payment is well known for everybody. The duration of the transaction or the payment plan is well known. Well, there is no riba involved. Having said that, how can we uh, justify, justify this $1,000 extra? Although it is introduced to you as interest, but in reality, actually, it is not, okay? This is, this is bay'u al-ajal. Or I mean, you can buy something like a spot uh, uh, sale, and you can buy it credit sale. In economics, there is something called uh, uh, opportunity cost. Opportunity cost. In, in, in certain cases, opportunity cost is acknowledged in the Islamic finance system, and in certain cases, it is not acknowledged. Now, your neighbor, if he has chosen, if he has chosen to sell that car, five thousand dollars, to somebody else, cash. He would have been able to make $1,000 profit if he involved that money in a business. He would be able to make $1,000 profit in one year. He has compromised that opportunity and gave you the car, despite the fact that you will not pay him $5,000 cash. You will pay him $6,000 within, within one year. So the opportunity cost in this particular scenario actually is acknowledged and it is legitimate and it is halal. However, once we close, once we close, and there is a term, that if you do not pay on time, like within the first three days of the month, you will be paying me late fees. Late fee, or, or that late fees actually is, uh, is haram. There is, no, there is no acknowledgement of the opportunity cost from now on because we closed, that's it. It is $6,000 for one year, 12 payments, 12 payments. Each payment is $500, that's it. That amount cannot be increased because of your delayed payment and cannot be decreased because of your early payment. Once we close, we close. That's it. You see? So this is just a very like a brief introduction of understanding the definition of riba. When I say riba, I mean riba, riba nasia. I mean riba nasia, which is the interest-bearing loan. You borrow money, you borrow money, and you know from day one that you have to pay more than what you have taken. Okay? And in some cases, in some cases, you get involved in a interest-free loan, but the riba actually is introduced later on. As I said in Muatta al-Imam Malik, كان الرجل يقرض الرجل فإذا جاء الأجل. I mean, people used to lend one another interest-free loans. So upon the maturity of the, upon the maturity of the, of the loan, the borrower would approach the, the, the lender by saying, أمهلني وأزيدو. Give me more time and I will pay you more money. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, prohibited this uh, transaction. After this very long uh, introduction, certain you know, topics that we need to be aware of, maybe one of them is mortgaging homes in the, uh, in the U.S. Always remember, العبرت في العقود للمقاصد والمعاني لا للألفاظ والمباني. What matters in transactions is the reality and the essence and not the formality or wording. When you say so and so person mortgaged the house in the U.S., what does it mean? What does it mean? And how many transactions actually involved in, 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 in the mortgaging process? Number one, there is a sale agreement. 
I mean, you as a customer, okay, as a client, you buy a house from the landlord, from the owner. And that's bayah, right? That is, that's bayah. وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيَعَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted sale agreement. Number two, if you, if you want to go like traditionally with the, with the mortgage process, you go to a mortgage company, and the mortgage company actually pays, I mean, upon, upon uh, you being approved, I mean, after checking your credit and your annual income and on and on, upon the approval, they pay the price of that house on your behalf to the landlord, okay? And you know from day one that you have to pay way more than what they have paid on your behalf. Well, this is an interest-bearing loan, straightforward from day one, okay? So they pay on your behalf $100,000, and you have to pay it back $150,000 within 10, 15, 20 years more or less. So this is an interest-bearing interest -bearing loan. And the third agreement is the mortgage one. Well, the mortgage, you know, the mortgage company does have the right of putting a lien or mortgaging the property to secure their fund. I mean, how can they make sure that you will be committing to paying on time for the next 10, 15 years? What if you, Allah forbids, passed away? What if you foreclose? What if you, you know, something happened? What if you run out of business? What if you stop? I mean, they want to secure, you know, secure their fund. Well, mortgaging the property of the borrower itself is a straightforward halal transaction. That's called the rahan. Mortgage means the rahan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually mentioned the, you know, the, the, the desirability, actually. I, I don't want to say it, you know, the command, but the desirability of mortgaging the property of the lender by the borrower to secure his fund. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ وَلَمْ تَجِدُوا كَاتِبًا فَرِهَانٌ مَقْبُوضًا A rihan actually means mortgage. So the mortgage itself, according to the Quranic terminology, is to put a lien on the property of the lender until he or she pays you in full. So you do have full authority to secure your fund. We do not have any issue with the, with the rahan according to the, to the Quranic definition of a rahan. We do not have any issue with the sale agreement because you buy a house from the landlord. The only thing that we have, the only concern we have is the fact that you borrow money with interest from a conventional mortgage company, from a credit company, from a mortgage company, from a bank, and that's an interest-bearing loan. So after like, you know, unlocking the secret of the mortgage, we can easily say that, that mortgaging a house by default is not a halal transaction. We have three different transactions, right? We have, we have interest-bearing loan, and we have a sale agreement, and we have a mortgage, mortgage agreement. Two halal versus one haram, then the whole transaction is halal, no. One haram transaction is more than enough more than enough to ruin the whole deal and to make it and to make it a haram to make it a haram one. So the default rule is that mortgaging a house is not permissible. This actually does not mean that if there is a necessity involved, I mean someone is running out of options, someone has a big size family, for example, a lot of kids, uh, uh, very limited income, cannot find, uh, cannot afford renting a house, for example, cannot rent an apartment. There is no Islamic mortgage uh, uh, companies or Islamic alternative available. Uh, almost, almost about to be like, you know, kicked out from the apartment and about to be, you know, kicked out, you know, um, and, 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 and just, you know, th thrown away in the, uh, in the street. And the only thing that he found at that time is to mortgage a house. Well, that is, that's a necessity, okay? And it has to be taken on case, case by case basis. But we cannot generalize the fatwa and say, okay, Mortgaging homes is permissible because there is no Islamic alternative. By the way, do we have an Islamic alternative for mortgaging a house in the U.S.? We did our own homework as, as the Assembly of Muslims Jewish of uh, America, and we, uh, we have our own declaration in our website. Go to Amja online or just, just Google Amja Islamic Mortgage Companies, and you will read a very long declaration in both Arabic and English about the major uh, um, 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 Islamic or so-called Islamic mortgage companies in the U.S. Okay, namely, Lariba, Guidance Residential, Devon Bank, University of Islamic Financial, and Ijara Loan. You read a lot of details about why MJ actually is believing that such and such company is acceptable enough and, 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 and such and such company is not, you know, acceptable, you know, at all. And some of them actually are permitted if there is a dire need, some of them are permissible. If there is a need, some of them are not permissible. This is our ishtihad. We might be right, we might be wrong, Allah, but this is to the best of our 
of our ability. So this is the mortgage issue. Uh, uh, another maybe major topic that we need to be um, aware of a little bit is the uh, uh, retirement account. Is the retirement account. Before we jump to a conclusion and say there is no Sharia compliant options, all the portfolios that you have in your 401k or your uh, 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 503b or like uh, individual retirement account or whatever the name or pension plan, you, we do not have a Sharia compliant 100%. Before we jump to a conclusion, we need to zoom out and look at the whole picture, okay? Uh, we need to acknowledge that, 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 that securing, securing financial stability for ourselves in this society is important during our lifetime and after our death. We are not asking too much if we want to make sure that our kids are financially stable, again, during our lifetime and after our death. If you go back to the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, when Sa'ad radiallahu anhu was trying to get a, an approval or fatwa from the Prophet ﷺ to donate or to bequeath two-thirds of his wealth after his death. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, that's, that's too much. قال النصف يا رسول الله how about one half like to donate it to give it to non legal heirs to non inheritors sad he said no that's that's too much he said how about one third can I donate after my death one third to non legal heirs to non inheritors قال الثلث والثلث كثير donating one third donating one third is okay yet it is it is too much and then he said عليه الصلاة والسلام إنك انتظر ورثتك أغنياء خير من أن تذرهم عالة يتكففون الناس. That is the bottom line. Leaving your family members, leaving your inheritors, your family members wealthy or financially stable is way better than leaving them poor, begging people. That's the fatwa of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام. So when you, زك الله. So when you when you work on securing a good financial position. For yourself, Allah forbids you might you might pass away all at a sudden. You might get involved in a car accident and just lose your job. You might be, become disabled. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect uh, all of you, Allahumma ameen. Um, after long you know, um, life, I mean, you will be retired. You won't be able to like work and, uh, and to make money. So you need to plan for a future, for, you know, for your future, okay, and the future of your kids from, you know, from now, okay. Having said that, one of the main ways of you know securing that financial stability is to have a retirement account whether this retirement account is 401k or 503b or individual retirement account Roth or, or like traditional one or simple investment account or a pension plan whatever the platform might be you need to make sure that you put some saving aside and you invest that money you invest that invest that money so at a certain point you will be eligible you will be entitled for a certain compensation. This is the philosophy behind having a, a, a retirement, retirement account. The problem that we face here, as I said in the beginning, that in most cases, we do not have 100% Sharia compliant options. Okay? You work for a company, and you have a, a, like a wealth manager or financial advisor, and he shows you like different options. We have portfolio one, portfolio two, three, four, five. You just pick and choose. Okay. And each one of them actually does have certain components that you are not happy with, that you are not happy with. And you are not in a position where you can make a decision. You cannot include whatever you want and exclude whatever you want. Maybe it depends on which company you work for, how much freedom you have in rolling over your 401k maybe to one of those socially responsible uh, mutual fund companies. But let's go with the mainstream. The mainstream is that you do not you, you do not have a word to say. This is what we have. You take it or you or you leave it, as they say. Okay. If you leave it, you are compromising the financial stability of yourself and your family members. If you leave it, you are waiving the match of your employer. If you have 401k by law, whatever you pay up to three percent match the match of your of your employer. Okay. So even even if you are 100 percent positive that all the options that you have in the table are not Sharia compliant or halal 100%, still this is not a sufficient reason for you to deny the 401k. Take it regardless. 
and do your best, do your best to purify that portfolio and make it as Sharia compliant as possible. If you reach to a conclusion, if you reach to a conclusion that my portfolio actually does have 15% haram, that haram is coming from bonds, coming from derivatives, coming from uh, haram investment, okay, certain stocks belong to companies where their core business is a haram one, they deal with interest, they deal with the haram business, whatever the reason behind that. You reach to a conclusion after doing your due diligence, you found out that 85% uh, of your portfolio is halal enough and 15% actually are haram. Well, if that is the case, just keep it as is. Keep it as is. Whenever you receive your money, you get rid, you dispose that 15%, okay, and the 85% remaining investment actually is still halal. In our deen, our sharia, there is no way for the haram money to contaminate and to, you know, prohibit the halal investment. And vice versa, the halal investment does not actually permit the haram, okay? Whatever is haram is haram, whatever is halal is halal. Where did we get this fatwa from? From the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ Be conscious to Allah as much as you can. Well, if you can make your portfolio 100% sharia compliant and you keep it 85 halal, 15% haram, then you are committing a sin. But in reality, to be practical and to be reasonable, you cannot make it 100%. Well, I assure you all, brothers and sisters, that there is no stock there is no stock walking on the surface of the earth nowadays that's 100% halal. Always there is a certain percentage of haram involved because of a reason or another. This is not our topic for tonight, but even, I mean, even if you open individual retirement account and you limit yourself only and only to stocks, and those stocks actually belong to companies where their core business is a halal one. Well, the fact that the core business is halal does not mean that the whole stock value or the surface value is 100% halal. Always there is a certain percentage coming from haram because of a reason or another. Something else that we need to consider here, although it's not an interest-bearing transaction, which is the zakah, the zakah in your uh, 401k. This is a very common question. How to, how to pay zakah on your 401k? We have three different schools here. School number one, okay, uh, uh, you do not have to worry about your 401k whatsoever because you do not have an access to it. You are not supposed to touch the 401k until the age of retirement, or Allah forbids in case of death or in case of disability. Okay? And since this amount is not accessible, then it is not zakatable. Okay? Because one of, the, one of the conditions for the zakatability of any kind of wealth is accessibility. Okay? You have to have full access to that money to pay the account. I mean, this is one opinion or one school. And the other one, which is, which is completely the opposite, that you have to pay zakah on 100% of your 401k, okay? And those group of scholars say that this is a, sorry, this is a kind of investment, and it is zakatable, so you need to pay 100% zakah on whatever you have in your 401k, okay? I do believe, along with, 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 with uh, like Amja Fatwa members, that both opinions are too extreme. One of them to the extreme right, and, and the other one is to, is to the extreme left. What we believe is the most moderate and reasonable opinion. And bear in mind that this is, you know, um, this is something subjective, ijtihadi. I mean, there is no nas. If you go to the traditional fiqh books, you will not find any answer on how to pay zakat in your 401. I mean, this is something contemporary, something new. And that's why we have, like, different schools of thought and different opinions, you know, regarding, regarding how to pay zakat on it. What we believe is the most correct and the most reasonable opinion is that you go every year, okay, you, you do some, some, some due diligence, and you find out how much is the accessible amount, how much is the withdrawable amount. If you work for, uh, for the government, for the state, for the county, for example, you do not have 401k, you have a pension plan. Okay? Uh, um, pension plan actually is uh, not that accessible account. I mean, even if you apply, even if you insist in applying for hardship or a humanitarian, you know, case, you will not have an access to any amount. If that is correct, and your pension plan is not withdrawable whatsoever, then I do believe that yes, you do not have to worry about paying zakat on your pension plan. But the vast majority of us here actually do not have pension plan. We have 
401k or whatever is similar to 401k. It could be 401k, could be 503b, it could be whatever. Uh, if it is 401k, which is the most prevailing one nowadays, if you do insist in withdrawing as much as you can every single year in the month of Ramadan where you calculate and pay your zakah, you will be having an access to a certain percentage of the account. If you insist in applying for humanitarian case for hardship, sometimes they call it depends, you will be having an access to a certain you know, percent of your account. To make it simple, what, what if you have $100,000 in your 401k? 100000 And the, uh, the accessible or the withdrawable amount is 50%. So if you insist in withdrawing as much as you want, uh, uh, I'm sorry, as much as you can, you will be having an access to $50,000. Is that correct? If you decide to proceed, you will not be getting $50,000 take home, as they say. You will be penalized, okay, charge some interest, processing fees, administration fees, penalty, you name it. So you do your own math, and this is a very hypothetical, okay, hypothetical calculation. You do not have to physically withdraw the money. But if you, I mean, if you insist in withdrawing, how much you will be taking home with you? You do your own math, 50, I mean, $50,000 in our example is the accessible amount. Jazakallah khairan, thank you. Do you have to pay the account that or not? <laughs> Let's say that the total deduction, the prescribed penalty and tax and interest and, and, and on and on, 5,000, okay? So the take home amount is, is 45,000, 45,000 dollars in our example. Well, this is the amount where you have to pay the account. According to AMJA, according to our Fiqh Council, you pay zakah based on whatever you can take home with you. So every single year, if you pay your zakah, if you pay your zakah in the month of Ramadan, then you pay it based on 2.5%. Well, some brothers and, and sisters prefer to pay, the, uh, prefer to pay their zakah uh, 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 in the month of December, like while preparing for the, uh, for the income tax, they calculate their zakah accordingly in the month of December. So they go with the, with, the, with, with the solar calendar, with the Gregorian calendar, not with the lunar one. If that is the case, that's fine. You need to pay zakah based on 2.575%. Because there is 10 days difference, 10 days difference between the lunar calendar versus, or the lunar year versus the Gregorian or the uh, solar, solar year. Not only that, if you want to be very, very accurate, and you want to go with the book, you do not want to pay even one single penny extra on top of the zakah, which is something actually not, not, not recommended. If the zakah is 2.5, make it 3, make it 4%. I mean, the more you pay, the more reward you'll be getting. But if you want to go with the book, that's fine. There is a, a certain part of the, of the, or certain percentage of the stocks is called fixed assets. Okay? If you, if you hold a stock, for example, for Microsoft, okay? There are like, you know, certain, certain percentage of the stock are commodities and merchandise and something for sale. But there are some fixed assets like buildings and properties and devices who are not for sale. And whatever is not for sale is not the cattle. Okay? The fixed assets might be 10, 15, 20%. By any chance, if you do have an access to the database of, of, the, of the like portfolio and you can find out exactly or approximately how much is the, is the fixed assets? Okay, you have $100,000 in our example, and the withdrawable amount is 50,000, and the prescribed penalty and charges and, and, and whatever interest, five, so the you know, net amount that you take home is 45,000. Well, maybe 15% or 20 or even more than that are counted as fixed assets. So this is actually the care exempt. So you do your own math, and the net amount actually is to be, is to be paid zakah for. Either 2.5% if you pay it in the month of Ramadan, or otherwise 2.575% if you pay in the month of December to accommodate the 10 days difference between the lunar year and the, and the Gregorian year. اللهم صل على شفيع المذنبين وحبيب رب العالمين اللهم اهدنا سواء السبيل Briefly 
can you can you use a credit card? Can you use a credit card? Can you have a credit card? Okay. Before we answer the question, as I always say, take one step back. What does it mean, credit card? When you hold a credit card, it means that you borrow money from a certain creditor called a credit card, you know, credit card company. And that money could be used, could be used either for purchasing items or for paying bills, or otherwise for uh, cash withdrawal. I mean, you can go to any ATM machine and just withdraw cash money. Now, based on the, on the principles of this business in the US, you cannot proceed with any application without agreeing to pay interest in certain cases. Number one, if you, if you use your credit card for cash withdrawal, you will be charged twice. There is a fixed or like, you know, flat rate fees, service fees, per transaction, and you will be charged a certain amount as an interest, okay, because you borrow money, right? If you, uh, uh, if you, if you do not pay your statement balance, if you do not pay your statement balance before the due date in full, you will be charged interest. If you pay it partially, if you owe the credit card company, for example, 1,000 and you paid $700 before the due date, it means that you have to pay interest on the remaining $300. So if you delay your payment after the due date, or if you did not pay in full for the due date, or if you use your credit card for cash withdrawal, and for some cases, like some credit card companies, if you use your credit card for international transactions, you live in the US and you like made a, a, an order online, you order something from Pakistan or from Jordan, okay? Some credit card companies consider this as if it is an, a cash withdrawal. So they charge you, they charge you three different charges. They charge you credit, uh, uh, currency exchange, currency exchange, because they like, you know, exchange the currency from US dollars to whatever the currency or overseas might be, which is halal. Okay, currency exchange, and they charge you wire transfer fees because they wire the money on your behalf to overseas, which is fine. And they consider that amount as if you have withdrawn it, you know, from the ATM machine. So if that is the case, you cannot use that particular credit card for international international transactions. Otherwise, if you are like very cautious and very educated on, on the system, how does you know credit card work in the, in the U.S. You might be able, you might be able to hold a credit card and to use it for years and years without, without paying interest, without paying interest. Now, before we answer a question, is it okay to hold a credit card or not? We need to understand that, that, that the, the prohibited matters in our deen are not in the same level. There is something called haram li dhati, prohibited for itself, which is when you walk, for example, to Bank of America and you borrow $5,000 you know from day one that that $5,000 will not be paid back 5,000. You have to pay more than that. So this is a straightforward, unavoidable interest. This is haram li dhatihi, prohibited for itself, unavoidable. And there is something else that's called haram li ghayrihi, prohibited for other reasons, which is when you borrow $5,000 from, some, from someone, and he tells you, listen, from now until the end of 2019, if you pay me the $5,000 in full, you're good to go. There is no consequence. But if you delay your payment after 2019, then you will be charged interest. So this is a conditional, a stipulated interest. Both of them are prohibited, okay? But the second one is less prohibited than the first one. Because the second scenario is avoidable. I mean, you can avoid interest while the first one is unavoidable. While the first one is unavoidable. Now, what is the benefit or what is the fruit of classifying prohibited matters to haram li dhatihi and haram li prohibited for itself, prohibited for other reasons. Well, our fuqaha says that al haram li dhatihi la tubihu illa al-darur. Whatever is forbidden for itself cannot be permitted unless there is a necessity. Unless there is a necessity. Well, haram li ghayrihi tubihu al haja. Whatever is prohibited for other reasons would be permitted in case of public or general general need. Now, I need, I need to ask a question here. Do we think that holding credit card, haram li dhatihi, where the riba is unavoidable, or haram li ghayrihi, where riba is avoidable? Well, it is haram li ghayrihi. I mean, you can, you can hold a credit card without paying interest. So it is haram li ghayrihi. Now, 
In order for us to permit it, we need to make a case that there is a need for it. I do not believe that holding credit card actually is something necessary. It's not a life or death situation, okay? But it is a public and general need. If you live nowadays in Pakistan or in Algeria or in Morocco or in uh, Bangladesh or in, in Jordan or even Saudi Arabia, okay, you do not need desperately to hold a credit card. The finance system there and you know, the, the, the monetary system and the business there is still simple. People until today, to my knowledge, they, 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 like they use the, the fiat money, the bills that we, 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 we use. I mean, you can easily function financially without using a credit card. It is not the case for Muslims living in the West in general and in the USA in particular. There are a lot of transactions and businesses cannot be conducted without having a credit card. You go to certain points of sale in which they do not accept cash money. They do not accept personal check, no cashier check, no even debit card. It has to be, it has to be a credit card, you see? So what I want to establish here is that there is a public and general need my need might be different th than your need or her need. But at the end of the day, there is a public and a general legitimate need for holding credit card. Okay? On top of that, when you hold a credit card, you can easily build your own credit history, credit points. So when you apply for a halal loan, for example, or you want to like, make a halal investment, you will not be denied because you have a, a, good, a, you know, a, good, a good credit scores, maybe 750 or 800 more or, or less. So there is a need for it. There is a need for it. And the riba actually is avoidable. And the riba is avoidable. Because there is a need for it, and the riba is avoidable, then you definitely can, definitely can have a credit card. As long as you limit yourself to the halal transactions and you avoid whatever is haram, then you can, then you can go for it. No? Uh, as Dr. Abdul Rahman said, inshallah, and I, and I, and I get my dinner, I get my coffee, or I took a nap, so I'm alhamdulillah you know, fully awake and I can stay until maybe tomorrow morning. Okay? So, salamun hiya hatta matla al fajr. Please wait after Salat al Isha and I will be taking inshallah your questions. So far, I have maybe around maybe 25, 30 questions. Inshallah, after Isha, I will be answering them if I have knowledge. I will be answering them, inshallah. But for now, let's have a commercial break with my brother Ayman Ishat from the Public Relations Department of Hudud University. And inshallah, we'll continue after Aisha, so stay around, please. When, when uh, the payment is uh, late, and when they explain it, they say, this is uh, in order to process the uh, late payment and do all the admin work uh, about it. Would that be considered as uh, interest or not? No. And as the couple of us said, I'm gonna go with a very brief answer. The default rule is that the, the, the debt or the loan has to be paid exactly, you know, with the exact amount. So you borrow 1,000, you pay it back 1,000. Sometimes an actual, real, legitimate expenses might be involved. Might be involved. If this is a one-time charge, justified as uh, uh, administrative fees. Okay, for example, if you do a the credit transfer from one credit card to another. Okay, we're running like out of uh, out of introductory period, and the debt actually or the loan is due, and you can't pay it. Sometimes you prefer or you tend to open another credit card, and the new credit card actually does offer you credit transfer zero interest. However, they ask you for a one-time charge, maybe two or three percent of the total amount that you want to transfer from the new credit card to the old one. If it is a one-time charge, justified as sales fees, that, that would be acceptable. But again, this is the exception and not the default. The default is that anything you pay on top of the amount you borrow is counted in interest unless otherwise proven. So, uh, I have my own question. Can I ask it? So, are you available after Fajr tomorrow? <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, yeah. uh, my flight actually uh, uh, is at 5 a.m. in the morning. Okay, then 5 a.m. What we time is it? You can come late if you like. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. What time is it? Now, Fajr here is uh, yeah, right, almost 5, five, five, five yeah. so. So, um, yeah, well, but if you invite me, then it's a welcome. It's our pleasure. Okay, second question here is about um, cash reward or points reward that we get from the credit card. Is that halal or haram? That is, that is halal. Bear in mind that whatever is prohibited 
is that when the creditor or the lender makes money out of the money that he lends you. So when you use your credit card, for example, you gain points, right? You gain points. Let's say, for example, that you uh, use your credit card for $100. It means, according to what we uh, discussed, that you have borrowed $100. Is that correct? Use it for one. It means that you have borrowed 100. Well, when you benefit from those points, okay, and you get five dollars back, it means that you have borrowed you as a borrower. You have taken 100 dollars and you paid it back 95 dollars. So you are the one who is benefiting and not the creditor or the lender, which is definitely better. That's not, you know completely the opposite of riba. If you borrow 100 and you pay it back 105, that's harm. But when you use like take advantage of those. Uh, like, you know, uh, points or coupons or whatever. The one who is benefiting actually is the borrower, which is you, and not the lender, which is also you. So definitely, yes, we can take advantage of this point. Uh, can someone use his credit card or her credit card to pay for Hajj, provided that they can pay on time without interest? Yeah, I mean, once using credit card is permissible, then definitely using your credit card for any permissible transaction, it's hard by default because it is a loan taking a loan to do Yeah, the, 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 the restriction here if you do have a, if you do have a due a due loan that you have to pay and you want to go for Hajj, you need to consult with the creditor and make sure that he is okay with you leaving the country. But the system actually works here differently. If you are involved, for example, in models or you have some payments for the credit card. Uh, company, you already set for monthly payments, you pay on monthly basis. So if you are up to date with your payments, that would be fine. I mean, even if you are like in debt, you still can go for Hajj because the debt is not is not a due yet. So you're good to go for Hajj. Uh, a general question about investing in stocks, especially if the, um, the stocks are related to a company that uh, primarily is using halal, just halal uh, business. So what is it? Like, uh, is it permissible to invest in Microsoft and uh, Google and whatever? Yeah, as I said, I mean, it, it's really hard in reality to find like a pure halal stocks in which there is no harm involved in there. And the standard here, again, be conscious to Allah as much as you can. If you have two options, a stock that does have 25% harm, regardless of where the harm is coming from, another stock, you know, has only 10% harm. Of course, when you go with the 10% harm, you don't go with the the 25 percent now this uh, stock of 10 percent harm okay would be would be would be harm in a different case if you have a third option like a stock with five percent harm so this one actually becomes harder because the other one actually is uh, is a mirror. so you just go with the you go with the minimum you go with the minimum harm and go with the side it is there a, a, a restriction of what would be the maximum percentage of harm that someone otherwise it would become haram in this yeah. We do have some, some ishtihad from different Sharia advisory boards, but honestly, we discussed that in this particular technical issue that you know the debt should not exceed 30 percent and the uh, interest uh, you know should not exceed five percent. There is no base. There is no base for this specification that the debt you know cannot exceed, for example, 30 percent. There is no base for it. Okay. The ideal situation is you hold the stock that is that's fully backed by assets. I mean, this is a new situation, but uh, in, in the real life, some of the some of the stocks actually, you know, represent maybe twenty or thirty or even 30, you know, forty percent cash money, okay, loan that's coming from from different, you know, uh, lending institutes versus sixty percent actual assets. Okay, again, your job is to verify and to make sure that you go with the minimum harm involved in those stocks. Do you? Uh, I mean, just just do your best. See. As for those, all these like specification, five percent, that ten percent, how long? I mean, there is no, there is no delete for that. And I've had to Mr. Uh He's asking about uh, borrowing from your own four hundred one k plan. Uh, you know that this is uh, interest based, but then the the interest will go back to your account, so no third party will be using. It. Yes, if we believe that the four hundred one k amount is yours. Whether that amount came from your pocket, from your cell, deducted from your uh, deducted from your salary, or came as a match from your employer, at the end of the day, whatever you have in your 401k is used, right? So whenever you decide to take money from your 401k, you have two options. 
you either withdraw, and if you decide to withdraw, that's a taxable money. So a lot of us actually prefer to borrow from their 401k. When you borrow money from your 401k, that's a tax-free or tax advantage one. Okay. Now, is it is it a real, actual, you know, borrowing borrowing, you know, activity when you take money, when you take, you know, when you when you withdraw money or you borrow from your own account? This is your own money. I mean, do you borrow from you, like from yourself? You do not borrow. So, uh, as we said, what matters is the reality and the sense. So this is transaction actually is not a loan to start with because the borrower is yourself and the lender is yourself. Okay, it's like a job, like as you are taking money from one pocket and just put it in the, in the other pocket. So borrowing from your 401k is permissible. Paying interest when you borrow money is permissible because as Dr. Abdurrahman said, the interest will be going back to home, to your account. So definitely you can, you can borrow from your 401k. A question about student loans. Now the student loans, the student loans are not uh, from a third party, they are not from a bank, they are from the government. So, um, do, are, do things have a uh, different meaning? We did actually discuss this issue now with the council in Anja, and briefly, uh, we said that we should encourage our students to be more active in pursuing different halal by default sponsorship opportunities. We have a lot of grants and a lot of financial aid, a lot of scholarships available, you know, there. Uh, unfortunately, millions of dollars, just, just FYI, millions of dollars are returned unclaimed to the federal government on an annual basis because our students are not active enough in pursuing those opportunities. So there is a lot of education that to be involved. We need to encourage and educate our students to go and, and just pursue those opportunities. If none of the above is available or insufficient, financial aid, scholarships, uh, <coughs> grants, then definitely they can go with, uh, with the subsidized loan. Subsidized loan is an interest-free loan for a certain period of time granted for financially eligible individuals or students as long as they are undergraduate. So those who are pursuing bachelor's degree or whatever is equivalent to bachelor's degree, if they are financially challenged, then they can apply for what is called subsidized or supported by the government. Okay. Well, in reality, this is an interest bearing loan, but the government who is providing the money is the one who is paying the interest. So from our perspective, actually, this is an interest free loan, but the, the interest actually is a, is a conditional one. Because if you borrow subsidized loan, okay, uh, uh, you would be having up to six, sometimes up to nine months called the grace period. So after you graduate, you're supposed to pay the total amount in full. In the reality, 99.9% .9 of our students cannot afford paying 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars in six months. They barely can find a job even within those six months of grace period. So in the, in the end up, when, well, according to the rules of subsidized loan, if you default in paying in full before the end of the grace period, the subsidized loan will be converted to an unsubsidized loan and they will start, uh, it will start accumulating or calculating riba from the very, very first time you have taken the first loan. So our position is that if the halal by default opportunities are not there, then going with a subsidized loan is permissible. Now the challenge here, what is the status of taking unsubsidized loan? Unsubsidized loan is an interest bearing loan from day one. Unsubsidized loan is an interest bearing loan from day one. It's not granted based on financial eligibility. It is available for everybody. So undergrad and graduate students can both apply for it. But the challenge here again is that it's an interest bearing loan. We discussed this issue extensively and we found out that if the only way, the only, literally the only way for a student to pursue a degree in a degree, undergrad, master's, PhD, postdoc, MD, whatever the level of education might be. If the only way for pursuing you know, a certain degree is to borrow money with interest by taking unsubsidized loan, taking unsubsidized loan for education purposes would be permitted. This is the official position of Amjad. Can you borrow money with interest to pursue a degree Yes, you can, if and only and only if, this is the only way. There are no financial aids, scholarships, uh, uh, grants, 
So Sida is known, is not available or insufficient, and the only way is to borrow money with interest. Yes, you can borrow money with interest for education purposes. It's a long story to make it short. <coughs> there is a definition of al-dhuwa, okay? مَا يَلْحَقُ الْمُكَلَّفَ طَلَعٌ بِتَرْكِهِ وَلَا يَقُومُ غَيْرُهُ مَقَامًا Which means, al-dhuwa is a unique irreplaceable matter which lacking its causes, causes harm to the Muslim. Education is not a necessity. I mean, we can live without holding PhDs or master. okay? But this is not the point here. Point here is that if that legitimate need, which is education, Education is not necessary, but it is a legitimate need. I mean, we need to, we need to like get get educated, but it's not a necessity. Well, that that legitimate need in certain cases cannot be fulfilled without borrowing money with interest. So, if that is the case, then borrowing money with interest would be interpreted as a rule. Okay. Uh, of course, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, this fatwa took uh, like I mean went through a process and voting and debating. But when we voted, actually, it was it was the vast vast majority of the uh, uh, MJ members against maybe one or two, uh, like who rejected the, the, the decision. So it became the official position of MJ. Yes, taking interest-bearing loan for education purposes is permissible as a dispensation, as a as an exception. If this is the only way of pursuing of pursuing a degree of law. Um, you might not like the fatwa. You might think that this is a very liberal fatwa. You might choose not to apply for a loan. You might not allow your kids to apply, you know, for an uh, unsubsidized loan. Well, we need to distinguish between fatwa and taqwa. Taqwa actually is the piety and the righteousness and how to stay on the safe side. That's between you and the law subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what we are discussing here is the fatwa, is the technical ruling. Is it permissible to take it as a kind of exception? The answer actually is Yes, for one. Uh, a common question was about uh, opening multiple credit cards because each credit card gives you an advantage of something. Um, no, it is. It goes beyond what your need is. Uh, but however, if you go to VCs, then they will tell you you have twenty percent uh, off uh, from your transactions on uh, the first two days of opening the card and that entices you to really open the card. So if you don't need it because you have other multiple credit cards, would that uh, become uh, lawful? I would, I would say just keep it to the minimum. I mean, if you need two to three credit cards, do not make them 25 or 30 credit cards. Have you seen like those people have like a big wallet like this? Like maybe 25, 30 different credit cards. I mean, that's, that, that's too much. We should not like take advantage or like manipulate the rule by exaggerating and having credit cards. I mean, you need one, two, maybe three, go for it. Because again, opening uh, or having credit card uh, or the permissibility of opening credit card is the exception and not the default. So we should limit it to the, you know, to the need. I need, I need to have one or two credit cards, I can use them. Because even, even if I, even if I establish a, like a good credit score or credit history, if I stop using my credit card, I will start losing points, is that correct? So you need to keep up with this your credit card. Keep it to the minimum, but do not exaggerate in opening, opening credit cards. Uh, and my last question here on the card is uh, uh, the Islamic position on uh, life insurance. The, the, the official position, official position of the contemporary, contemporary councils whether our Fiqh Council, Anja, or other Fiqh Council, is that life insurance, if it is a commercial one, is impermissible. However, we do have some people of knowledge, and their number actually is increasing rapidly, who believe otherwise. And this actually otherwise opinion has been initiated a while ago by Sheikh Mustafa Zalqa, the well-known Syrian Faqih, who has made himself clear since maybe early 70s of last century when, when, when life insurance and commercial insurance actually was discussed on a scholarly level within the contemporary uh, federal councils. So he made himself clear that the concept of insurance is a, is a Sharia compliant one. It's all about, it's all about cooperation, it's all about monopolies, it's all about like a mutual, you know, cooperation between, between people. He said, Rahmatullah, he must live well enough. He said that, that, that technically or legally speaking, all those different types of insurance are bilateral 
agreements are not unilateral agreements, which means that if you have an account with the social security, what does it mean? It means that social security is telling you, if you give me $150 every month, okay, if you commit to paying me $150 every month, I will be taking care of your kids and your wife upon your death or your disability, okay, within certain criteria. I will keep paying your wife until the age of whatever. I will keep paying your minor kids until the age of whatever. If you commit to that payment, you are eligible to be paid back by whom? By the Social Security. If you do not have an account for any reason with Social Security, you are not eligible for any compensation. I mean, they will not pay your wife or your kids upon your death because basically you did not commit to the premium. You did not pay and thus you are not eligible to be, to be paid. He said, life insurance is the same. Life insurance company is telling you, give me $150,000 every month. Upon your death, I will be paying your family members such and such amount. So he said, technically speaking, this is a bilateral agreement. And this is a bilateral agreement. And he made a very, very strong case that we need to distinguish between insurance as a concept versus insurance as a practice. In the real life, there is a lot of manipulation and, and, and you know, you know, taking advantage of of, of uh, customers and exploitation and on and on and on. But actually, he was saying that insurance is, you know, as as a concept, as a concept is a Sharia compliant one. It is based on cooperation and you know providing. <laughs> Social security or financial stability for the you know for the members of that of that company. Okay. Uh, recently, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Mniyam is still alive. He's a member of the Senior Scholars Council of Saudi Arabia. Sheikh Abdullah Bassan, another member of the Senior Scholars uh, Council of Saudi Arabia. Some other like well-established scholars believe that that life insurance is like any kind of community is like any like yeah, like like any other kind of commercial insurance, is like social security, is like a mutual based insurance. All of them are bilateral agreements, all of them are halal. For me personally, I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of Anja. I was actually with the mainstream opinion for the last maybe 30 years of my life. Recently, when I went back to Sheikh Mustafa Zarqa's book and read it word by word and center by by center, upon further discussion, further you know, reading, I found out that his opinion actually is legitimate enough makes a lot of sense. Uh, insurance as a concept, as a concept, is a, is a, is a Sharia compliant one. It makes everybody happy. There is no ambiguity, there is no misrepresentation, there is no gambling. You know from day one how much you pay. You know very well how much you will get paid in case of disability or death or whatever. So based on that, I officially change my position. And personally, personally, as Ma'an al I do believe that life insurance actually is hard. But the, the official position of Amja, is that life insurance is how they go with the mainstream, you know, uh, fatwa or uh, One last thing, uh, if, if someone buys, uh, if someone has already bought uh, a house through mortgage, and uh, maybe unknowingly that it was haram, or maybe because there was a necessity, and now the person is fine and he's well uh, paid and uh, things are, are much better. Uh, however, he is still paying the interest and everything. Any advice to those people? The easiest option actually is to switch, is, is to refinance with a with Sharia compliant company. And I do recommend, you know, guidance residential. It is Sharia compliant, you know, enough comparison to other companies. Uh, after understanding and analyzing the like, mortgage system in the U.S., after like deep analysis of their contracts and a lot of like long conversation with people in charge of this company, we as Amgen now believe that you know this company is reasonable enough. If it is licensed in your state here and someone wants to mortgage a house, you can you can safely, confidently mortgage your house with guidance and attention. So if someone gets involved in a mortgage, like traditional mortgage, then maybe the best option is to refinance, refinance with, with, the, with guidance and attention. If that is not an option for some reason, then you can definitely increase your payment. You know the amortization system. Your monthly payment is divided to one portion goes toward the principal and the rest of it goes toward the interest, right? And the more you pay, if you decide to pay extra, whatever extra will go toward the principal against the interest. So much so that if, if 
for example, the mortgage company paid $100,000 and you'll be happy, right? As an interest bearing loan. And after doing the math, you have to pay them 150 within 20 years. If next day in the morning, you could manage having 100,000 paid them 100,000, you do not have to pay one single dollar interest. I mean, that's the system. That is the system. So our recommendation again as MJ is that if Islamic finance is not an option for some reason, you have to make your payment to the maximum. If your, if your monthly mortgage is only 2,000 and you can afford $7,000 every month, then you have to pay 7,000 because again, Whatever extra you pay will be going toward the principal and keep the you know, interest to the to the minimum. This is the second option. The third option actually is to sell the house, but do not foreclose, please. Do not just walk away and leave that. No, you can sell the house. Selling the house actually will, will, will keep you financially in good shape. You will be benefiting from the equity that you have made. I mean, if you already have been living in that house for years and years, you are building equity, is that correct? So when you sell the house without losing money, you can, I mean, get your equity and you know, try to find an understanding of the alternative. Allah has a good Sheikh Dr. Ma'an, Jazakallah khair. Very much uh, appreciated all the time, all the effort by Dr. Ma'an. Jazakallah khair and Jazakallah khair. Again, it's a very, very pleasure to meet with you. Inshallah, hopefully, inshallah, we can arrange with Dr. Abdul Rahman. You know, having, having uh, like different sessions on the future. Jazakallah khair.